All right, folks, what's good? We are back. Another episode of Ain't No Seats, the new era, some are mm -hmm. saying, of the mm -hmm. Ain't No Seats podcast. Uh, we're back recapping Mizzou. Um, Going to talk about T-Rob. Uh, you know, he gave a great speech. It was awesome. Saturday in Lawrence, fun day. Um, but we got to start with, okay, we mentioned last pod that we are now, we're back solo. We're out doing this thing on our own. We are no longer affiliated with a network. What that means is, we mentioned this last time, when it comes to YouTube, if you're watching, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Send it to everyone you know and get them to subscribe. But also, if you're an audio person, which is where most of our listeners have always been, is Apple, Spotify, all that. Go in and subscribe because now when we get new episodes, when we record new episodes, it's not going to come straight to your phone like it was. Um, that audio feed is no longer ours. We have got this new one. It's like we're starting from scratch, essentially. All our old episodes are still sitting over there, but the new ones are here. So if you want to know when we record, have it delivered straight to your Apple podcast or whatever it is, please go subscribe. Uh It'll help us. It'll help us get this thing going. But again, it's a new era. We've got new ideas. We're going to do more fun stuff. Last week was as fun as it gets with CB and, and that whole crew. So, uh, yeah, that's my uh, my housekeeping items of the day. B-turn, AB, how you guys doing? Missouri game, KU gets another win. Wouldn't say it was the most thrilling basketball game, but beating Missouri is beating Missouri, right? Yeah, feels good to uh, kind of play ugly, not play very well, and still control the game. I know they were down in the first half early. Um, Mizzou's, Mizzou's team was pretty hyped up. Their bench was fired up. KU kind of pulled it together. Shout out to um, Kansas minus eight first half betters. Uh, KU was down six with six minutes left, and they end up up double digits going into the half. Kevin got fouled shooting a three to end the half, so – yeah, it feels great beating Mizzou. I can't think of the last time. Maybe I'm forgetting. Hopefully, I don't sound like an idiot, but I don't remember the last time we lost to them in anything. I know we don't. We're not in the same conference. They don't play each other much, but kind of pumped them the last few years in basketball, football. We obviously haven't played for a while because they dodged us in a bowl game. Um, but yeah, feels great beating them. You still feel that hatred, and they showed some of the classic videos of movie scenes, the Simpson scene where you just yes. you think about hating them and the old games, 2012, all that stuff. So it's it's great refreshment every time and obviously love beating them. You know, KU, every KU fan does. I think the last time we lost to them was the game we talk about all the time where flopping Steve Moore uh, <laughs> takes a charge, right? So it's been quite literally over 10 years since we've suffered a loss to Missouri. Um, AB, as I mentioned, wasn't the most exciting game not a lot that that we'll talk about from that game. Like I really, I don't know, as just a casual or not a casual fan, but like as a as a KU fans out there, like what do we take away from this game? Is it just hey, we we beat Missouri? It is onward we go, or like is there is there more to take from the fact that we continue to kind of play ugly, win ugly, but we keep winning, and that's the most important part. It is the most important part. At the end of the day, we're nine and one, uh, well on pace for that twenty nine and two record that we were talking about before the season started. Um, as far as the game goes, nothing really. I mean, Timberlake had a shot. That was cool to see. I'm like, for a second there, I thought he'd turned his whole season around when he came in in the first half. But I mean, KJ had a cool block. But like you guys have said, like you watch that game, there wasn't a whole lot that's going to stick out. When someone asks you about the December 2023 KU Mizzou game at Allen Fieldhouse, there's not a lot you're going to remember. Like if we have guys on two years from now, like we had with CB last week, mm -hmm. it's, it's not going to lead to as much conversation as it did with him where he was screaming, yelling the whole game. And it was just a complete shit pumping from the jump. This was just kind yeah. of like a weird, boring basketball game that, yeah, there's a rivalry and yeah, people were juiced. But, you know, it was they won a game. They beat a non-con team by nine, ten, whatever it was, and they looked yeah. weird doing it. They didn't look great. They didn't play their best basketball. But as of now, a win is a win is a win. So you got to take it. Yeah, yeah. And AB, you you watched from home, and mm -hmm. I I really obviously I saw KJ's block at the field house. People went crazy. I really haven't looked at too many replays of it. I don't know why, because usually I it's love stuff crazy. like that. But Mizzou fans, of course, 
Um, people just come into Allen Fieldhouse assuming fouls. Um, so some people are saying it was a foul. No, I haven't seen it. No, it was, it was pretty clean, right? It was as clean was as, about as clean as you can get. Yeah. It for a not for a a chase down block like that. It's about as clean as you can get, and it, it was violent too. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was KJ Adams is reaching like, and I don't know where he ranks. But he's up there as one of the more athletic guys I think KU's ever had. Like, he does something every game where it's like, holy crap. Like, how many guys on the list of Kansas basketball players could do what he does athletically? But for them to call that a foul, that's just – that's insanity. <laughs> now, um, that's a fan base that loves to talk about blocks being fouls, so mm-hmm. it doesn't surprise me. Yeah, I just – those – I'm not saying – I'm obviously not saying that play decided the outcome of the game, but those are the plays in Allen Fieldhouse that – if opposing teams could somehow prevent, like who knows? That was that would have got it to like single digits. It would have put a little nervous energy in KU. It looked like I mean he had a ton of space, a ton of room to just go dunk it. Um, kind of slowed down, and yeah, KJ made a crazy play. But he's um, God, he's really good, man. I I know that sounds pretty bland, but the last three has 18, 18 and seventeen. Um, obviously, he's gone through the family stuff and. For him to rise up and just be as good as you could be. I remember he caught a ball. Mizzou was pressing full court there for a while yesterday. KJ kind of caught the ball, free throw line, um, crossover or between the legs crossover, went full court, dished it, layup. And you're like, whoa, from a six yeah. seven guy that because I had I had a couple buddies during the game saying, like, why is KJ bringing the ball up? I I feel pretty comfortable when he when he has the ball. Mm-hmm. And it's nice having a non i mean you can kind of call him a guard but a non-guard that can handle it especially late in games i mean mizzou they kept getting layups late they kept getting free throws late and ku had to take care of the ball beat the press um it's nice having obviously two point guards can take care of it kev and then you have a guy like kj who can take care of it too so if they were able to force turnovers late that game could have got interesting because mizzou kept extending the game and with little layups so it was huge that take care of the ball late and make free throws KU was 20 for 23 from the free throw line wow that is huge that's crazy because that that's a game where if you start clanking free throws you start to hear the groans in Allen Fieldhouse and Missouri just starts to inch back inch back and then it's a game that can easily get away from you so that is huge but KJ as I was saying like he's rising up the ranks of most loved Jayhawks. Like, you know, there's those guys. We'll talk about one of them here in a bit, but T-Rob. Now, obviously, you don't always want it to be because of a tragedy, but, like, the way he's handled it, the way he's, uh, you know, stepped up while dealing with all of it's obviously awesome. But also, even we go back to his freshman year, like, that dude hardly played, but every time he did, just came in and played with so much energy. I still laugh to this day. Like, the last shot Caleb Love puts up at the buzzer, it's K.J. Adams with a hand in his face freshman year. Like, that dude, it just shows how much Bill Self has always trusted him and and loves him. But as I was saying with the athleticism thing, and you mentioned with, like, bringing the ball up the court, K.J. Adams is so close. Like, if he could develop any sort of a jumper at all, he will play in the NBA for a long, long time. The problem is he's so far away. I don't know. Like, he's pretty far away from having a jumper, though. Like, we've made Draymond comparison jokes before. but Like, Draymond has a little bit of a shot. Like, so do we think – and I know people said in the offseason that KJ's jumper was developing, and I'm not making fun of the guy, but we've seen a couple attempts. It's not close. It is not close. So I don't know. Is it is it realistic to think he could ever have even a remote green light from mid range ever in his next year and a half at Kansas? Yeah, I really don't know. I don't I don't know how many years he has left. Um, he's he's a junior, right? Does he have an extra year? No, I think he came no. in twenty twenty two, so yeah, he's yeah. just normal. <laughs> the COVID stuff kind of confuses me. It's but... going to be weird to get back to normal where it's like, oh, so he got an extra year. Yeah. It's like, nope, he, just four. Yeah. He mm-hmm. obviously has kind of a – or, I mean, not kind of. He has a hitch in his jumper. Um, I was just thinking yesterday, and I don't know how much he'll do in the off season, but it's always guys that got to wait their turn. I mean, Kev had to do it. 
obviously you got Kev and Hunter that are all American. So next year, maybe he expands his game, shoot it a little bit. Dewan's probably going to be the same, the same way. I don't, I don't know if Dewan's ever going to change who he is as a player. He's really selfless um, and wants to get everyone involved. Kind of heard CV talk about that. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know, man. I, it's tough because you got to be able to shoot it to play at the next level, unless you're just a nutty defender, stupid athletic, which he is. So I'd have to really think on that, on, on a guy that I could compare him to at the next level. Um, but with Bill self, man, you never know. I had the longest conversation randomly with someone last night in Lawrence out at the bar about Jeff Withy, and I'll never forget, obviously different different scenario. He's seven foot and can block shots, but I'll never forget when he transferred from Arizona and how goofy he looked. And he still always looked a little goofy, but he, I'd never thought that guy would be an impact player. I never thought he'd see real minutes. He is the shot blocking King at Kansas. Like if you go look at the, so you just never know with bill and how these guys can kind of develop. I, I feel like even a guy like Marcus Garrett, that we thought might not ever be a shooter. And I'm not saying he was lights out, but he definitely improved as a jump shooter throughout his career and became a little more lethal score. He could get to the rim more. He could shoot it more consistently. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if he's just going to improve as a shooter. He's going to do a lot of stuff to impact the game. We know that. But, yeah, obviously he's going to have to expand his game a little bit if he wants to play at the next level. But that's obviously a guy that any team could use. He could li live in overseas for a long time and make some good money. I don't know what he wants to do as a player. But, yeah, he – to start the game, to start the game, he shot like a 10, 15 foot floater that drilled the backboard. And, <laughs> and then from there on, he was so good. He, I think he finished with 17 or 18, probably our best player yesterday. I mean, Hunter took a lot of attention. So that opened things up for KJ, but he was, I don't know how many shots he even really missed after that. Yeah. Either way, he's a guy that even me, like two weeks ago, I was talking about, well, maybe is there a scenario where KJ's minutes go from 35 to 30 down to like 25 so that Furphy maybe gets more playing time? But it's just not going to happen. Like KJ Adams needs to be on the floor. Does he make sense next to Hunter Dickinson? Not a lot. Missouri flat out wasn't guarding him, and it hurts Dickinson in a way, but he's still going out there getting 12, 14, 18 the other day. Like he's having – He's still making an impact that is just not something that anyone else on this team can really bring from an athleticism standpoint. So KJ Adams is here to stay. We've kind of known that we knew last year when he got moved into that starting lineup at the five, that he was just one of those bill self guys that he was, once you're in the trust tree, you're not leaving it very often. So KJ is the man. Um, and we'll see. I think, I'm trying to think as we like head into, I mean, we're close to conference play. It's crazy. Right around um, the corner. I'm trying to think like what I want to see because we're, we're getting to the point. We're not quite there. We will have a, we'll have a stretch in, and AB, I think you'll disagree with this. We will have a stretch in January or even early February where we don't look good. We just will. I don't know why it always happens, but the fan base will melt down. We'll have that stretch, but then we'll turn it. We'll figure it out. But like, I'm trying to figure out what I truly want to see most over these next couple weeks heading into conference play that shows me like, like, is it defense? Does this team just have to become really, really good defensively? Or are they kind of like, where are they at Kim Palm? Defense. Seventh on defense. Like, that's what's funny. We're all sitting here like, man, I wish this team, this team should be better defensively. And they're like, a top 10 defense. They're awesome. So I don't know. Yeah. Like the shooting, I don't think we're just going to get better shooting overnight. So it, I guess maybe it's Are we still... that bad at shooting though? I thought I saw something more like 38% or something this year from three, which as a team, that's it's not yeah, that bad. But a lot of it could be inflated from like small game, the first game of the year when no one was missing. And that, and then like, we just, I don't think our volume compared, I don't know. I'd have to look at that, but like, also, Dewan, Dewan's numbers are very skewed from the from the Kentucky game. Um, yeah, that first game of the year was insane. McCuller, though, I mean, it if he's still doing what he's been doing, I don't know. Like, do we believe McCuller can keep doing that? I don't know. I would hope maybe he's having one of those years where we just see with those guys that come back to school and just kill it. But 
I can't decide if it's shooting, if it's defense, if it's just simply getting El Marco being a really, really good player, or is it Timberlake? Like, I I can't decide on what I really want to see over these next few weeks to be like, okay, this team is locked in. They're going to make a Final Four. They can win a national title. I still kind of already believe those things, but it's because I think something's going to come where we see a big improvement. B turn yeah. your mic good. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah you're good. good. Okay, yeah, it switched to the external. I don't know. It's mm. weird, but yeah, I obviously I just I've said it before too. Like I always just think Bill Self will always have previous better teams, so we always it just feels like we're spoiled because we've always seen better. Like we'll always, like now we we don't think we have like a scoring point guard. We don't think we have athletes. We don't. I don't, we don't think we have shooters, which we've shot it well. I don't think we've shot a ton. I think a lot of that has to do with Hunter probably being – he's probably close to 50%. DeWan doesn't shoot – DeWan doesn't shoot a ton, and he's up near 45% or so. So we don't shoot a ton of them. Um, I just – I still – I feel pretty good about the progression of El Marco at the moment. Like, I know he's not doing anything crazy. I just think he's getting more comfortable. Mm-hmm. I – I know we talked about it with CB the other night. Like he's always going to dwindle down the rotation. So a lot of some of the guys I talk about right now probably won't even play. But I still I still have faith in Timberlake. I think it's a mental thing. And then obviously with Jamari um, and Furphy, I think those two dudes are fearless. They don't they don't think about anything. They just go play. And you see a lot of freshmen come into Kansas. And they're a little gun shy because Bill, Bill's the goat. We know that, but he's going to get on your ass for making mistakes. So guys are going to come in and not take shots that they normally would, or they'll brick a layup, or they'll make a mental lapse defensively, um, just because they know Bill will yank your ass right away. Um, but Jamari and Furphy, I don't know how much those guys will play. Like once it gets really into Big Twelve player in the tournament, but. It's nice to be able to have those guys say someone gets in foul trouble, you just need a spark. Those guys are going to come in and just not – like those two dudes are like – they don't have – they don't okay. make mistakes, but they don't – they just go play, and they play well, hard. That, and Furphy, will, like he'll get on the boards, he'll defend. They had him on – they had him guarding Sean East, who's a really good guard for Mizzou there for a second. So I – I just, but, I, but let's talk ahead. about this because CB, you know, as he said, and we've always said it on this pod, like we worry about depth, 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 and then it gets to the point and it's like we're playing seven guys. To me, I mean, you right there just mentioned nine guys. Well, not nine. You mentioned eight, but you got to include Parker Brown in the list because he has to play. He has to be as a he has to be a backup player. So if we're going under the uh, assumption that Bill Self's not going to play more than seven. I tweeted it on Saturday, like oh, Nick Timberlake, that. I about just called him Justin. Nick Timberlake <laughs> fired a ball off the rim. And I'm telling you, I, and Bill Self, the last two weeks in his press conferences, has made comments about like, well, you know, Nick's making, he, I don't know how to word it, but like he's, he's not doing those little things that Bill Self cares so much about. He's forgetting to put a body on a man. He's not running a play correctly. He's doing those things that just makes Bill Self lose trust in you. And he's a senior, so it's like there's no time. There's no really upside to continuing to let him uh, develop. So what I'm getting at is if we have – I mean, we're almost to the point where we're going to play seven guys. One of them is going to be Parker Brown. So who is the seventh? Is it like Furphy very clearly? Is it – Bill's still giving Timberlake a shot, but like – I, the decision's got to be made here in a few – over the next month or two, don't you think? Probably, yeah. I would say it's Furphy. Furphy was – Furphy's been beating Nick off the bench lately, hasn't he? First guard off yeah. the bench come in. I noticed but, that against Mizzou. I can't remember the games before, but it just feels like I, – I, I noticed Furphy's out there more than Timberlake. For sure he is, but – and I guess, yeah, you still probably got to give Timberlake a chance, but I'm also getting to a point where, like, is it – I guess, did they play together also? I mean, maybe that's the thing. But, like, sometimes when Timberlake's in, I'm like, well, this feels like wasted time or we could be getting Furphy Mm -hmm. minutes. And Furphy got – I mean, he fouled a bunch on Saturday, which hurt him. But 
So I don't know. It it's just if you it had me thinking after CB said that, like we keep talking about Jamari and Furphy and Timberlake, but we know Parker's one of them. So so then it to me it feels like those three are battling for one spot. And here we are in December, almost conference play. We're getting to the finish line where one of them's gonna just be the guy Bill trust, I think. But who knows? I just looked at the Yukon game. Furphy played 14 minutes and Timberlake played two. So oh, it's yeah. not a conference game, obviously, but if if those are the lineups we're going with in big and important games, I have really no reason to believe unless significant progression happens that Timberlake's going to get back into that spot. What were their split? What were their minutes from Saturday? Uh, eight and six, but like you said, Furphy got three fouls in eight minutes. Yeah. So. But yeah. yeah, I mean it was pretty even. Um, I don't. Did Timberlake play in the second half? I don't know. I don't... Can you guys hear me again? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, why don't we uh, – I'm down to talk about the team more, but why don't we get into the legend, number zero, from D.C., T-Rob. I mean, he was certainly a legend, gave a great speech. That was awesome to see. But he really is, and I think we we talked about it with CB and those guys, but, like, it was so fitting that he was there for that Missouri game because we were just sitting here before this, before we recorded, trying to decide like, what are the things you like? What are the moments of T Rob's career that stand out to you? And it's so funny how defining the Missouri game is like that. Even though this is a guy that almost won national player of the year, he was an all American big 12 player of the year. It still is just, that game was so incredible. That, like that is I don't know if there's a player connected to one singular game more than T Rob is to Missouri. Maybe Chalmers to Memphis. Uh, but outside of that, I really don't know. Yeah. Elijah I, Johnson and Ames. Yeah. I mean, um, Mario obviously hit the shot, but there was no history there between Memphis and KU. Um, T Rob, there was a ton of history. First off, you got one of the biggest rivalries in college sports, and then the stuff that happened in Columbia where they said stuff about his family um, in 2011 and you lose the game in 2012 at Mizzou. And then you come back home um, and T Rob obviously played with a ton of energy from the jump. The whole building was crazy. All the players were showing a ton of emotion, but T Rob, I mean, he, he had his Jersey in front of the bench after the block, he was going crazy. And then after they won, he was right in their face in the bench. And T Rob's a quiet guy that doesn't, he, he keeps a lot of stuff close um, to his chest, so he doesn't a lot of, let, let a lot of stuff get out. You don't hear much from him, but he showed it with his emotions that game. Um, and, yeah, it was – obviously the block was huge, but that that entire year he was just – he was so consistent in 2012. And every he had double digits in every game. He had 27 double-doubles his junior year, 2012. That's crazy. 27. That's I don't – they probably played, what, 40 games if they went to I mean, the title game? Could Dickinson yeah. do that this year? I think he could. Yeah, I don't know how many he's at right now. I don't know how many double-digit rebound games he has. But, yeah, T-Rob, if it wasn't for a crazy freshman and an insanely talented freshman in AD, what a one national player of the year ends up being a top-five pick or whatever he was. But it was i think the biggest thing we've talked about this before too is just 2012 how many question marks there were um you had t-rob who was pretty solid in 2011 but he came off the bench you had the twins tyshawn was a starter he obviously had experience but you had a lot of question marks no depth and it just shows how good he was and tyshawn was that senior year they get they win the big 12 they get a two seed they obviously make it to the title game but i remember having so many question marks about that team and just shows you how good T Rob was. I mean, Elijah hadn't played a ton. Trav had waited his turn. Withy um, was a bench guy. Like you had one starter back in Tyshawn, and they were that good in 2012. They played in the national title game. They tried to make a run against Kentucky, but that tournament run was as fun as it gets. I mean, you can't think really of a tournament run. Obviously, there's been national titles, but the comebacks and all that stuff and the Ohio State game, stuff like that. And so. it was just so needed after the Northern Iowa and then the VCU. And you said it, like, not only did you lose the VCU, we're not going to get into that, but you then re- you lose everybody. And, like, if T-Rob goes, that team, that's the – I mean, that that's maybe a team that doesn't even make the tournament. I'm not kidding. Like, I'm sure we would have figured out something, but – 
T Rob, you want to talk about guys making a decision to come back? That was one of the bigger ones in KU history, if you really look at it, because that team, they had nothing outside of him and Tyshawn on paper heading into that season. Elijah Johnson had not proven anything yet. Travis Relaford had not proven anything yet. Jeff Withy had not. So, like, it, it's crazy how needed that tournament run was for KU fans because of just how devastating the last two NCAA tour- I mean, you go into the tournament, Barack Obama's picking you in 2010. He picks you again in 2011. And I don't care what anyone says, the 2011 team was the best team in the country. It wasn't even close. They would have slept walked through that Final Four. It, to this day, is as devastating of a loss as you'll ever suffer as a fan. And so for T-Rob to come back when he really needed, like this was before NIL, he needed mm-hmm. money. Like that was that was the hardest part about it was like you wanted him to come back, but it was like shit. Like this guy needs, he's he's taking care of his little sister. Like his little sister essentially was relying on him, but he did it the best way possible. Where he was just like, all right, instead of going and being like a fringe first round pick, I'm coming back. I'm going to be the best player in the country and. By doing that, he made life-changing money and set up, as, as we saw, like he's doing great, got a great family. So he's for sure just like one of, the, I think, forever the most loved Jayhawk ever. And you could feel in his speech on Saturday how appreciative of it all he was. But like, hey, we needed him bad in 2012 and he delivered because like you said, that tournament was was as good as it gets. Yeah, and the, the crazy another crazy thing about 2012 is just how – how much they were missing too. Um, ben McElmore and Jamari obviously were ruled ineligible right before the season. Um, I remember I was I went to the Chiefs game with Tyshawn like a month ago, and we were talking about that. And I was like, would Ben have been like, would he have been solid his freshman year? Would he have been good? And he just like stared at me for 10 seconds with like a smirk. And he's like, dude, Ben was <laughs> like, Ben dude. was him. Like, he was they were ready saying he was the best school. player in practice that year. Yeah, yeah. LB Larry Brown was talking about that, and then he obviously proved that the next year. But with that depth, with the depth they had, those two would have played a ton. And then it's so wild. I'd never have thought about it, but Tyrell Reed said it on our pod last week that if he would have redshirted, which probably should have, he wasn't going to play, he would have been a part of that 2012 team, which, God, it would have helped our depth and shooting tremendously. But they still, they still made – the national title um but yeah just t-rob with the family stuff in the speech and it was it was super emotional um just listening to him talk and like i said he's a quiet guy so you don't hear from him much he wasn't able to come back a ton but just hearing the love he has for kansas you knew he did but just hearing it and how genuine it was i mean how ku fans were so attached um, to that just his story in there for him, but for him to love Kansas back as much as he did was, was just incredible. And he'll obviously always be one of the most loved KU players of all time. And I just love the family KU is like him talking to Hunter Dickinson all week, like Hunter Dickinson just got to KU and he's so tapped in with the history, like him and T Robert already locked in and he's been here for a couple months and it's just, it's special to me. Yeah, he he's an all timer. That's for sure. And I said, like, I put a note down when we said we were going to talk about him. I remember we had Keith Langford on the pod and I said, that's like the coolest dude. Like, he was just the coolest guy. And I know that was like when we were kids, like that's us in like first, second, third grade. So back then, those guys all seemed just like the coolest ever. But Keith Langford, even looking back on it now, I'm like that dude, the shoes, all that. But I think T-Rob also falls into that category of like, just a physical specimen. I mean, just a guy that you had no doubt him going up against the other team, he was going to be the stronger guy. Like he was just in on top of, as we've mentioned, all the adversity he went through and he just always seemed to deliver. I mean, even like Missouri, he gets that and one and he's not, I don't remember what he shot from the free throw line, but he was never like a good shooter. Mm -hmm. That's still think about that. You've got a guy probably in the, I mean, 60% 60% or 65, 68% free throw shooter, maybe better that year, but he's going to line in that moment where you've got to make that free throw on that N one. Like he's just clutch. And even the fact that he got the N one, the block, all that stuff, just a dude that always delivered. Um, so yeah, 
He's he's a legend, a no doubter that he should be in the rafters, but for sure, like even even one of those guys that hundreds of years from now, when you're talking Kansas basketball, he's a guy that I think would still get somehow be a part of the history even 200 years from now. I don't know. Yeah, maybe not. We'll see. It's wild. He will be. He's one of the most beloved players that I've ever seen come through here, at least at least with the fan base. Like Devontae is probably in that group with like guys that you just know lead Mm -hmm. Lawrence, Kansas and especially after hearing what he said yesterday, like Braden was saying, yeah. you can just kind of tell. He he embraced it all, and it was cool to see. Because growing up, and that was like right in the age where we were all, all, all in on KU basketball. Like that was right yes. before we were all going to Lawrence to go to school there. So we had like – I think that's probably when our connection was the deepest, like 16 to 22 is yeah. probably what I would say. And he was right in the middle of that. Brought us to the national championship, Final Four. Uh, mm-hmm. he's, he's the GOAT. I love that guy. Yeah, and Braden, yeah. Braden's got to break out the impression of him too, because that was like one of the, the hardest I've ever laughed in college was you breaking out those Thomas Robinson. I'm um, I need to come up with like stuff to say, but I I was gonna say something to him last night about it just because he I would do that on Vine and he would mm-hmm. kind of interact with me and like you said that was peak fandom so that was like the coolest stuff to me like obviously we loved Keith and those guys growing up, but then when you get to that point through Kansas history you watch all those teams and then you're about to go to school there and you're die hard. Like those teams just meant everything. But um, yeah, I'll, I'm um, it's obviously insanely sad, but it's one of those days that like when his mom tragically passed away, like that's a day, like I remember every single thing from that day when they played, they played Texas at the field house. Like that was, that was the saddest thing. And it's kind of wild. The same thing, obviously tragically happened this year with KJ. So it's kind of just been a weird, and then he does it or they retire his Jersey against Mizzou. So it was just, it was fitting, but man, I'll never, I'll never forget it. Texas at the field house and they were on that big winning streak at home and they got out to a big lead. And it was obviously a, probably a long, out long hours for them um they were probably drained but i'll i'll never forget that and it was just so sad but it was so cool seeing KU fans and just people all around the country behind them i remember he was on the espn special for game day talking about it and he obviously had a young sister he pretty much had to just raise her and he was a junior in college like that is just it's a wild story KU was so behind him and i'm sure throughout the years he's he's really thought about just KU fans as a whole. Like as he gets older, I'm sure in the moment it's tough. You're so sad, but just thinking about how much KU fans are behind him, but he yeah. loves, like he loves us as just as much. So. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's the best. Um, All right. We got to talk. Cause we were all talking about this before we hit record. I don't know if it was because the game was boring what, where are we at with the KU Missouri rivalry? Like, I feel like we're at a spot, and maybe football getting going. Both programs are in good spots football wise. Maybe that'll get it going. But, like, obviously, Jeff Long's the guy that brought this rivalry back. Jeff Long has turned out, as we look back, to be an utter train wreck of an athletic director. Oh, boy. Uh, so, I don't know. AB, I want to start with you. You mentioned it. You just weren't up for this game. And and I kind of said it. Like, it feels like we're in a spot where 2021 was fun because it was back and we destroyed them. And then 2022 was fun because they were 9-1 and one and we were undefeated or we were maybe not undefeated, but we were 9-1-2 and one, two or something. They were a good team. And we just go in and kill them. But then this year, it felt like we had to kill them again. Like, we had to win by 25 for it to even matter. And it just was such a snoozer of a game. So I don't know. Like, is it? Am I? Ju- are we just affected by how boring of a game it is, or is this rivalry just not not what it is when it's not a conference game? To me, I think it's a lot of reasons. Uh, I think I'm more like tied in with friends and family with K State in that regard. To where, I, like, personally, I see more of their stuff. Plus, their the conference thing I think matters because even when you win those games, it doesn't propel you in the race for the conference championship. Or you know, it's just like it just doesn't mean as much and you like i know i was talking about it during the game i wasn't super into it 
but I was before the game. Like I was, I was watching all the KU Mizzou videos. I was watching this and that. And then it's like the game started and we got down seven, eight, 10, whatever it was. And I'm just like, they win, they win. If we lose, whatever. Like I'm a, I'm not going to see too much of it, but it's, it's just not the same ever since they left. And I think the conference thing where the games don't mean as much probably equal that, but I just think it's going to be a lot more of this going forward. If we keep it going. Cause like you said, the, the last two years, yeah, they were blowouts, but it was the first time they played at Allen and we played at Mizzou in over a decade back to when we were in that core fandom that we just talked about rooting for KU harder than ever. So, yeah. and plus, I don't think it helps. I, I think it's awesome that the game ended with the T-Rob block and we thought the series was over and then it was just gone for a while because that question kind of lingered in everyone's head like, oh, this is the last thing we saw. Mm-hmm. And it was like, I don't want to say overinflated the rivalry because that rivalry is insane, but it almost like brought back different memories and it's just not even close to the same. Cause when you say KU Mizzou, you think of that 2012 game where Mizzou was top five in the country. And you think of the game at Arrowhead when both teams were top five. And now it's like one team's really good. One team's pretty average. And when football might change that, but it just, to me, it's just literally just bragging rights. And I don't really have a bunch of people that are Mizzou fans close to me. So those bragging rights don't mean as much to me anymore. I mean, I do think, if we were a lot like if if that game's coming down to the final five minutes and we're about to lose, like I think you're going to start to feel that feeling yeah. of like I can't deal with Missouri fans on Twitter if KU loses this game. Like we got to win, but yeah, it's just it. I almost wish I think we all agree that you know I'm not one of those people that's like mad the rivalry's back. Like there's people that are passionate about the fact that the rivalry is back. I'm not one of those people. I do think it maybe would have been cool to not have it come back until Bill Self retired. Like, have it be something where Bill Self, who so passionately was against Missouri leaving the conference, didn't give a shit. Like, he was like, we're not playing them. Why would we play them? They could play us twice every year. They just stay. Like, he was so – and just the way – we tweeted a clip from the pod today, if you haven't looked at it. He was – he went berserk. And not just after the final play – even as he's walking through the court, shaking hands, like on the middle of the court, he went berserk. So I sometimes do wish it would have been cool if, like, let's say Bill Self's here another 10 years, please God. Um, after that, you bring it back. And then does that have a different feeling because now it's like a new coach, new energy? I don't know. But it it is at the point where we've got to have a competitive game and both programs need to be good for this to have any sort of non-conference, you know, fun to it. Yeah. Like Kentucky's always fun because Kentucky KU is always a juggernaut of a matchup, but like Mm -hmm. we can't be winning every game by double digits forever for this. It's not going to be fun. Yeah. That's like, for there's just a lot of things for me here. Um, Just, I, I definitely wonder what it, how it feels for Mizzou fans playing us in basketball because I, I can only imagine how badly they want to beat us because, like, it's Kansas. Kansas is a blue blood. You can make an argument that they're the best program ever, at least one of the best. Um, so I, I definitely wonder what their perspective is because, obviously, we go into these games, but at least the last three years, we expect to win. We expect to blow them out. So it feels like a lose – like a lose lose kind of, well yeah, because um, exactly you got to blow them really. out. Um, mm-hmm. So I I I definitely am curious to see how it's going to feel from a football standpoint. Because first off, basketball you play so many games in the year. Like there's bigger games for us on our schedule already. Every like we're Indiana, um, Kentucky, probably K State, and some of the Big Twelve rivals, um, but. And you play so many games, but football, you play once a week. So it's like you get that build up of the full week. We play Mizzou, boom. Like, so I, there's a definitely, there's just a lot of thoughts. Like, I don't know if it's us getting older and losing excitement, but you just go into it. There's, you're favored by a ton. You expect to not only win, but blow them out. So it's like, it doesn't feel, you don't feel yeah. the excitement or you don't feel anything crazy when they do blow them out. Like, yeah, it's awesome, but you pretty much, you have to win. It would be so different if these last two years, Missouri was top 10 team and they were both just thrilling mm-hmm. games, but 
you're just not going to get that. I don't think Missouri is, I mean, Dennis Gates is good. I think Missouri is still a ways away from being a consistent top 10 team. Who knows? I don't know. But the way I'm looking at, we got, we play in Columbia next year easily. And by the way, like we're not going to go into Columbia and just kill them every time. Last year was pretty crazy. Crazy. KU, yeah. I mean, everyone went like, we just throttled them. It's not going to happen like that every time. But if we do go into Columbia and win easily, and then we've got two in Kansas city, I don't know how the contracts work, but like if, if we win all these games and we don't get, and I know we're far away from knowing this, but even if we win all these games, do you, do you want to see this again starting in 2028, 20, 27, whenever that would be? Do you want to see five more renewed? I don't even, I don't, I don't know if I do. I just, how, how much does it mean anymore? I know we hate them and there's so much history with, Quant, I've said the word control way too many times this week, but all that, like, so you want to beat them, you hate them still in your heart, but like, how much do these games really, these basketball games at least mean anymore? Like, you win the game, cool. If Mizzou wins, it's, it's going to be the end of the world. That's kind of what we've said forever, and Mizzou fans have cried about, but like, it's, there, there's no, there was no benefit for us playing them. That's what Bill said forever. And I'm yeah. pretty sure he was salty that it was renewed because he didn't he didn't want to play him. So yeah. Mizzou fans obviously they get mad at KU fans saying that stuff, but maybe I sound crazy saying how much do these games mean? I don't know if you guys agree with that, but it's like what well it doesn't. And I mean if we're gonna use them as a non conference opponent when we could go be playing uh Arizona. Well, that doesn't make sense. Well, I'll be in the Big 12 next year. But like uh <laughs> even Kentucky, I know that's hard because we play them once every three years, anyways. But I don't know. Like there's other schools that if we're gonna add a high, you know, a big conference school, it's not gonna be Missouri. It's gonna be Michigan State, it's gonna be Michigan, it's gonna be UCLA. Like, I don't know. There's just no Missouri is not a school if there was no rivalry ever. It would be like if we were scheduling home and homes with like Ole Miss. We're not going to probably do that. Like that is so from a scheduling standpoint. Yeah, it just isn't moving the needle and we could find much better. Now, is but, it fun to just shit pump them? Yeah. But does it mean anything? Not much. They're going to I think they're going to keep it going, though, because money talks, right? Like, oh, yeah. And as we've learned at college sports, there's yeah. nothing that matters besides money. Right. Nothing. So, like, yeah. I mean, ticket prices will be crazy for all these games, and more people will tune in. I bet the casual KU fan is more likely to watch KU versus Mizzou than KU versus Northwestern or mm -hmm. Wisconsin or something along those lines. Like, it just that's the kind of game that I'd like to see the ratings compared to like other times we've played. Um, I don't know Tennessee or something like that, but it's just. I feel like they're going to keep playing it. I don't feel different one way or another. Like, I don't know. It's it, Do we think that they would exchange that Mizzou game with a game against a good Power 5 team, or would they replace it with North Dakota yeah. State and have another freebie on the schedule? Because they play they, every year they play – they're always going to be top 10 in non-con strength of schedule, it feels like. like they're, they're always yeah. in one of the top tournaments. They're always playing, it feels like, one or two road games every you know mid-December like Indiana coming up. So yeah. – it, uh, if, if they're going to sub it out for another game that's really intriguing, that would get people excited, then sure. But I don't want to, I don't want them to get rid of it just to add a, you know, a group of five or mid major team. Yeah, for sure. And I, I, as I'm, as we're sitting here talking about this, it's like, think of Kentucky Louisville. If we could get to the point, I mean, and the reason that rivalry has been good is because Kentucky Louisville are both great basketball programs. So if you could get back to the level of it's Phil Pressey and those teams, which Missouri has always just kind of had those teams once every five, six years. But like, if you could get to that point where you're consistently, you know, you're going to turn on and see a top 25 matchup, then yeah, I could get behind it. But because Kentucky Louisville works, those fans still hate each other. It's different because they were never in the same conference, but yeah. I, that's just what I want. And we could be sounding stupid here because if we get trounced in football back to back <laughs> years, they'll be saying the same stuff, but I don't think that's going to happen as of now. But yeah. We'll see. And I guess uh, what I'm kind of trying to say is there's just no stakes either. Like even when mm -hmm. they're in the big 12, you hate them and you want to beat them, but sometimes it comes down to 
potentially a Big 12 title, like the last game in 2012. So, yeah, there's just not many stakes. But I, like I said, I am interested in the football thing because get a little tailgating going, get a little drinks in you, it gets a little spicy in there, probably see some fights, and you can't really afford to lose many college football games um, during oh, yeah. a single season. So I'm definitely interested in that. The Arrowhead games were obviously – there was one they, fun game. The other two, the others sucked. They but. could be very fun. Um, you mentioned stakes. I've got to throw this out. AB, um, how does it feel? LeBron won in season tournament championship. MJ, none. It and stakes. I mean, LeBron making his teammates rich. Wow. Sounds like LeBron. LeBron having his first son lose to Long Beach State in his college <laughs> debut. Sure. Yeah. Has Jordan's son ever done that? No. Wow, sorry, his son's a hero who just came back from a very no, scary. That, that was good for him. I mean that, but yeah, I, I was I was looking forward to Le, LeBron talk because I've already seen it on Twitter, and I know it's all like it's all tongue in cheek, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't get triggered by one or two of them when I uh, was scrolling through last night. Dude, Scott Chasen made a really good point. It doesn't matter now, but in thirty years, if the end season tournament matters, you're gonna look back and be like, oh. LeBron won one of those. LeBron won the first one. And maybe LeBron's the reason this ends up mattering. Not saying it's ever going to matter, but it was really smart of LeBron to protect his legacy just in case this ever matters. Well, frankly, I still don't think it would matter if it does turn out to be a big deal because we could still always just say, well, Jordan never played in one. So if it's LeBron has one, Jordan doesn't. That's never going to hold water. But he, I guess I, like if, if it actually does become big and they can have a – him on the logo of the trophy or something, winning the first one, sure. But he was the second best player on his team yesterday, and that's fine. So. <laughs> he is – he's unbelievable, man. And it's the longevity. Obviously, everyone knows that he's been in the league for 20 years. And any night – I mean, he could go get you 30, 40 any night if he needs to. Like, if his team's trailing, he'll he'll go get a – can. I've said it forever. He can get to the rim whenever he wants. It just depends. He'll do the little look down at the floor, pull a three <laughs> – whatever but he's he's unreal and obviously when the stakes were higher everyone was all in on this in-season tournament i mean you saw the players playing harder um the yeah, bucks I, the bucks pacers total was 260 which is so wild but all those ga- i think all the games in the in-season tournament went under um so yeah they were playing a little defense but yeah lebron he's unreal he's still so explosive um just yams on guys gets to the rim whenever he, I think he had like 12 in the first quarter last night, and he de- he could have ended up with a huge night if he didn't get into foul trouble, which hurt Turner in the old betting market. I needed I needed Braun to have 30 to win a good amount of money, but God, he's so good, and it just feels like it's it's never gonna slow down. Like when he takes so good such good care of his body, um, doesn't really get hurt much. Sure, he might act like he's hurt a lot on the floor when he gets fouled. Um, he's, he's an old man, but I like, when's it going to slow down? I, dude, I was going to ask you like, that, like, because AB, every, you've, well, how long has people been hope? Like people like AB that have say. wanted his downfall. Like at what year did you start thinking, okay, now's where he'll start to dwindle. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, but, but I think that's twisting the argument. The argument's never been – they just showed the replay of the Chiefs offsides. I on know. The touchdown I'm triggered. <laughs> I'm um, but my, never, my argument's never been that he's not good at basketball or he's not extremely talented or one of the best players to ever live. Like, it's never been that. Obviously, it's impressive what he does. I think he's the corniest, cheesiest dude of all time. His quote saying that he, he wanted to give Father Time a loss, impossible, dude. Impossible. Because even if – I just – Again, nitpicking. He kind of is, though. He's not, though. But in basketball standards, if he plays till he's 45, he beat Father Time from a basketball standpoint. No, he just delayed Father Time beating him by six more years. But like <laughs> like Rice said, the five-year thing, I guarantee five years ago we were, like, we, we were saying the same thing. I bet I was saying the same thing. When's it going to slow down? Maybe five years from now. Now he's – he can get a triple double any night, 30, 40, whatever. He's just as athletic as everyone. He's just as quick and as explosive and as strong. Like, I feel like if he wanted to, he could still be productive. Like, 
five years from now as a 45 year old man or whatever, like it is, it's truly. And that's why AB, we obviously hated Tom Brady. Like he broke our hearts so many times, but towards the end of his career. And when he started getting funny on social media, like you just start respecting him because even you think about his weapons, even towards the end in new England, I've been thinking about this with the chiefs because obviously the chiefs receiving room is not good, but at the end, Tom has Edelman, who was old, Hogan, who was just a slot, slow white guy, and then Josh Gordon, who was never good after Cleveland, and then old Gronk go, beats the Chiefs at Arrowhead, goes to the Super Bowl, wins it. Like he is just, and they're they're kind of the same. Like they take care of their bodies, they don't get hurt, um, and that's like two of the most impressive athletes ever from a longevity standpoint. Like there's. There's just no way to me, and I'm the biggest Michael fan ever, but there's no way to me that there's a better overall basketball player than LeBron. The, th wow. he, the way he impacts and has his handprint all over. The, like I know Jordan 6-0 and in the finals, but the way LeBron impacts the game and gets everyone involved, like – he like it's unbelievable, and he's still doing it at this age. I know LeBron or Mike still played with the Wizards late in his career when he was old. Um, he was still solid twenty a night, but LeBron's like triple double guy. And when I know it's load management too, he sits and he'll sit some nights. But when you need him to be great, um, he'll he produce. He's un, it's unreal. Well, that that was talking LeBron. Well, uh, let me ask you this: Would you guys would you guys rather win? Uh, an in-season tournament or the NCAA tournament? Because one of these two guys, one of these two guys has won one of the NCAA tournaments. The other one has. Hey, I respect <laughs> the awesome. day. I respect going out and finding that. That was a good thought. Going out and finding it. You had to come up with a history. way. You had to come up with a way to match the in-season tournament. And so you went and found, you know, college, things that don't matter when it comes to the GOAT argument. Because LeBron was literally so good, he didn't have to waste his time in, in college if we were really going to play that game. Oh, boy. But let me say this. I do – I find – I used to like 20 – I mean, 2010, 2016, I was so – I mean, I was so obsessed with LeBron. Not even obsessed with LeBron. I was so obsessed with how – I couldn't fathom how stupid it was that people acted like he wasn't better than MJ or even close to MJ. Like it used to just make me mad that it made me more passionate about it. But I will say, well, I still think he's the best player of all time. AB, you mentioned him being corny. He is one of the corniest mans alive. Man's he alive. Makes me, man's alive. He makes me laugh. Those clips, on, those, those clips on TikTok. Of yeah. him lying, just lying all the time. It is so funny. It is the classic example of a man, man surrounded by yes men, and he just does and says whatever he wants, thinking nobody will ever call him out on it. I just, I, I love him. I picture just anytime he's with a group of people or something, they just laugh their asses off at the stupidest things, like the and he's telling dad jokes. jokes. Yes, <laughs> because it's LeBron. Like he's yeah. got. I think he has a good amount of money. I'm not sure. Um, he's pretty powerful. He's pretty good at sports. Um, so obviously you're going to kind of yeah. suck him off. I don't want to get too <laughs> visual there. But, yeah, I I don't know how much more you guys want to talk about Braun. But I was no. I wanted to talk about a, either a little Big 12 Ken Palm update or just kind of talk about um, Assembly Hall this weekend and our upcoming schedule. So I don't know which one you guys – want to touch on we could five ten more minutes but i just want to say on the indiana game so i want to say this just because it's i've had a bad feeling about this indiana game for the last 12 months uh i just it feels like a game where a, a missouri or indiana is not good i think it's very clear but it feels like a game where that place is going to be rocking that place is incredibly loud great venue I, I feel like it's a game where we could, and it's our first really, it is our first road test, right? Yeah. yeah. It's our first, first road test. Not that these guys have never not played in the road. Hunters played in the building, but I just have a feeling it's going to be one of those games where everything goes right for Indiana and it's going to take us being really, really good to win the game. I do not think we're going to be able to kind of ugly it out 
like we did even on S- Saturday against Missouri. Like, I think we're going to have to bring our A game. And I don't know, AB, I feel like you're out on Indiana a lot. So do you feel like uh, we could play average and win this game? Yeah, I kind of do. Uh, Indiana's not very good, boys. Uh, I think it was Gary Parrish tweeted out the Kim Palm rankings of the four D1 teams in Indiana. IU is dead last. It was I know, but like Purdue and Indiana State's higher than them, and Butler is higher than them. Indiana gave up 104 points to Auburn, lost by 30. Like I know that college basketball is weird, and it's just, but I just don't see it. Like I, I don't think Indiana is that good. I think it would be What's... a bad loss if they lost the game. Oh yeah, I mean I think it'll be a bad loss, especially because Indiana is not going to be like it. Are they going to be a tournament team? Probably not. Not looking that way. But if they are, it's going to be like an 11 seed, a 10 seed, a team that sneaks in. Um, but what's the line going to be? What's Kim Palm have it at? Seven. Man. Which I guess, like, home dogs of seven points probably went every Saturday. So, like, I guess I, sh- I wouldn't be stunned, but I just – I really don't think it's going to happen. I don't think Indiana's very good. Yeah. yeah. they're. I mean, they're not very good. I didn't – wasn't very high on them going into the year. They got a couple transfers. They got Mbako. I wasn't very – I mean, I wanted him to come to Kansas because he's a big recruit, and I think he could eventually be really good. I wasn't very high on him, um, and it ended up working out tremendously for us, which is just so wild thinking about it. But, I mean, Rye's dead on. Like, this is – no matter how good they are um, or what people think about them, this is a game that they've known about for a while now, and this is a game that I'm sure people – it sold out very quickly. Like, it's it's a known – building where it's one of the loudest in the country and it's going to be they're going to get up for it like sounds obvious but we're gonna have to play well like you can call it basketball you can play like shit and somehow find a way to win ugly we're gonna have to play at least decent basketball a lot better than they did saturday um i know auburn just went and pumped them but that you can kind of make the argument to where they're going to be woken up a little bit like they're they're going to get their asses whooped i'm sure in practice this week and they're probably they don't want to get embarrassed again, obviously, at home. Um, so yeah, assembly will be wild. Obviously, think about Hunter Dickinson in Big 12 or Big Ten territory. Gurley talked about it, how he was getting booed even at the Champions Classic by Michigan State fans, and we weren't playing them. So that'll be an environment he thrives in, which I was kind of disappointed. I didn't see a ton of emotion out of him against Mizzou, which I know he hasn't he played wasn't. against them, but he wasn't that involved either. Like he just didn't, we couldn't get him the ball and yeah. And I don't know, but yeah, in the, it'll be an interesting game. It will be, it'll be one. I'll tell you this though, AB, if KU does win that game, the 29 regular season wins, we're back. I mean, we can, the, the the next like month and a half of the schedule. uh, Where? Where's our what? next loss if we beat Indiana? Even though, I mean, you think Indiana is probably one of our easier games over the next couple months. I mean, God, dude, all of our road games are against like sub-75 teams in Ken Palm before Iowa State on January 27th. Like, I, I don't know, dude. I just don't know when the next loss is. And I know sports are unpredictable, so you never know. But the most predictable thing in sports is KU wins at Allen Fieldhouse. <laughs> So yeah. half the games are going to be there, and all most of the road games are against teams that aren't very good, like Oklahoma State, UCF, West Virginia, teams that are but down this we've, year. So we've like, lost to some stinky Oklahoma State have. teams. We've lost to even that. Oh my gosh, you remember the Dedrick Lawson team losing at West Virginia? Oh my god, that was that one of the most frustrating off. games. <laughs> that was terrible. West Virginia team won like four Big Twelve games that year. They so, were not good. Yeah. Boy, are That's we lucky to. Are we lucky to have the field house? Like, what mm-hmm. would what would that score have been Saturday if that's on even like a neutral floor? We did not play well. Kev was four for fifteen. Hunter didn't even really get touches. Like, no, our it, stars didn't score. KJ was really good, but it is crazy at Allen Fieldhouse. We were down like what? We were down eleven, I think, 65. or something. And like my brother turned to me, he was like, "So on a scale of one to ten, what's your like level of worry that KU okay, could lose this game?" And I was like, literally one or two like two because like you know and i'm trying to get on DraftKings a live bet the shit out of that game and it wouldn't work because of the service i'm like this is called money making time 
this is where Allen Fieldhouse is voodoo and we will always make a comeback. So yeah, it is crazy how massive it is to just be able to look at a schedule and be like, okay, half our games are at home. <laughs> half our games are wins. hundred yeah. percent. Chalk it up. Like, like maybe so, account for one, but us yeah, three, but... us three have said it. Like we, and we just talked about losses, like tough losses. We can, this team, they're going to lose a couple games that we do not think they like going into it. We'll be like, we'll be super confident and they're going to, they'll lose because there's going to be nights where this team scores like 55 points or something, dude. Like I can just see it. Kevin is a great player, but statistically over time, he hasn't been an elite like knockdown shooter. So there's going to be nights where Dewan just, he's not going to shoot. Obviously Kev doesn't score. There's going to be, and then they're going to double Hunter in the post and he's going to have to dish out and our guards are going to have to make jumpers. So there's going to be random games. I feel like we lose. Um, so I don't, I mean, the schedule could look easy. I don't know. I was going to go over the Ken Palm, big 12 Ken Palm. There's six big 12 teams in Ken Palm's top 19. Mm -hmm. So like a third big 12 teams, seven in the top 30, nine in the top 38, 11 in the top 46. So I always say this, like going into the year, I, I'm not tuned in with these other teams and I'm always like, maybe the big 12 will be down. It ends up, I feel like maybe we're biased and we hear it a lot from people around here, but Big 12's always in the combo for best basketball conference every single year. Yeah. Like last that, year, almost the whole league made it. That's why all jokes aside, it's still going to be really tough for me and AB when we were kind of like predicting that we could go win 28, 29 games. It's still going to be mm -hmm. really tough, but we've done, you know, beating UConn, beating Missouri, and then you go beat Indiana, we're in a really good spot to to be close. But that you you list stats like that, B-Turn, and it's like, God, man, it's still going to be a street fight every single night, it feels like, outside of – sounds like, I guess, a pretty easy start to our conference season. But yeah. I feel like even with if, – if they go, what, 26 and 5, like that's probably still a one seed. Oh, yeah, I be. think – So, like, maybe number one overall – I think, yeah, if we – assuming we don't have a stretch where we just drop, like, three of five or something, like, I think a one seed. With the resume we've already built, I mean, we've already beat Tennessee, UConn. a team that just had a good win the other day. We've already beat uh, UConn. And we Kentucky. beat Kentucky. Kentucky. We've – I don't care if Indiana stinks. If you win at Indiana, that's still that's going to be win. noted on your resume. Missouri's going to be a tournament team, I think. Um, so – yeah, it, our resume is going to be insane. And then you mentioned like what B-Turn just said, we're going to beat a bunch of top 20 Ken Palm teams also. So yeah, because we're going to have home games against the, like BYU was five or six on Ken Palm before they lost Saturday. Yeah, and AB mm -hmm. is planning on, <laughs> AB is so obsessed with. I mean, there's the three teams. KU, BYU there's, that's there's like three. three months away. Three teams ahead of us on Ken yeah. Palm right now. They, KU in their last 10 or so games, they have five games against top eight teams in Ken Palm. So, like, it's a battle in the second half when you start having to play Houston. You get them twice. You get Baylor. You get BYU. Well, it's perfect because that's when we will be so locked in. Like, that's yep. the best-case scenario for us. So, all right. Well, as we always do, we said, hey, boys, maybe 45-minute pod tonight. Here we are in hour three. Didn't account for five minutes on LeBron, but uh, that's on me. Had to make that joke. Um, we may be back this week, uh, maybe lining, trying to line up some some sort of interview or, or something fun like we did last week, but we'll we'll keep you guys posted. But again, subscribe, subscribe. Maybe Please. even go. It's been a while since you guys have left reviews on Apple Podcasts. I don't even know if that stuff means anything anymore, but <laughs> just go leave some funny reviews. Maybe we'll read them on the show. Uh, so, yeah, we'd appreciate it. We're we're trying to make this better. We're trying to have more fun on this show. I know this one wasn't exactly a banger, but uh, <laughs> we just had to talk Missouri. So subscribe. Like I said, it'll help us a lot, and it'll make sure you get the the episode sent sent right to you. So uh, anything else, boys? No. I All right. Big. Well, I'm sure we'll do a football preview before the bowl game. We're still a couple weeks away. Obviously, we haven't touched on that, but yeah. play UNLV – um, in Arizona, and it'll be yeah. If you can. <laughs> be nice to watch the Hawks again. Hopefully, get to nine wins, and then yeah. So far, we haven't 
had many guys touch the portal. So that's it's great news that we're not getting guys from the portal because that means the guys are staying, the guys that competed all year with some of the best teams in the league will be back. So, yeah. All right. Well, that's it. We will be back next week or sometime later this week. So uh, thanks for listening and rock chalk.